feel very fortunate today to introduce today's guest, Leilani Schweitzer, because she has touched the lives of so many people, including mine, with her 2013 University of Nevada TEDx talk titled Trans- Transparency, Compassion, and Truth in Medical Errors. I've showed Leilani's TED talk to literally thousands of nurses across North America at my legal issues and nursing conferences. It's been an integral part of the program of for 10 years for me, or 11 or as long as that video has been out. I know Rick, my husband, sent it to me the day he found it, and I've shown it at every conference since that time. And I'll tell you, when the lights go up and that video ends, and it's a room full of nurses, sometimes 350 of them, there's always a full minute of silence and rarely a dry eye in the house. And there's never not a newly enlightened nurse in the room. Lailani's beautiful 20-month-old son, Gabriel, died after a series of medical errors that occurred over several days in two different hospitals involving multiple health care providers and some incredibly sophisticated medical monitoring equipment. Amazingly, Leilani now works at the same hospital where her son, Gabriel, died. She says that a profession in healthcare did not choose her. I mean, it did. Let me say that again. She said that the prof- her profession in healthcare was not chosen by her, but it chose her. She's currently a patient liaison for Stanford University Hospital's risk management department, and she now uses her own experience with medical errors to navigate what she calls the rocky waters of the often litigious and administrative side of medical error and the emotional side of the patient and family experience. Leilani says that her work at Stanford has given her a unique view of the importance and the realities of disclosure and transparency in healthcare after medical error. As a parent, I can connect with the worry and the fear and the exhaustion that we've all known when caring for a sick child, but can only begin to imagine the unimaginable shock and grief of losing a child and the incredible life task of dealing with the aftermath. As a nurse, I have silenced literally thousands of alarms in my career, never once imagining that it could or would result in death. So I w- I'm always not only enlightened to that possibility of error, but in awe of the compassion that Leilani finds for the nurse who turned off the alarm and the doctor who cared for her son. As a medical legal consultant who's been doing this kind of work for 20 years and works on the same fallout side of medical error as Leilani does, I share her vision for revolution and I greatly connect with her desire to affect change. And I am honestly in awe of the fact of how she's now using her own painful experience to help others through theirs. So welcome, Lalani. Let's get started. I am so grateful that you're here today. Wow, Chris, what a what a really um, I'm really humbled by that introduction. Um, I I appreciate it very much. You know, when I when I did that TED talk, that was nine years ago already, and I knew about TED. I knew I knew it had a big reach, but it wasn't quite as ubiquitous as as it is now. Um, so I really had no idea what or could have imagined what was going to come from that. Um, it, it was very it was very challenging. I worked really hard at it, but um, I I really appreciate your kind words and that you you feel. Um, touched by it and that, you know, that's, that's my son's legacy. And that, that really is important. And, and I appreciate that very much. Mm. Well, you're so welcome. I've, I've appreciated that so much. And I, you know, my husband's an IT guy and he puts up with everything I do, but we sat down to watch this talk again on the weekend. And even he, every time he hears it, it's like, just wow, you know, there'll be seven, eight, nine, ten wows that come out of his mouth at, um, you know, the things I mentioned, your insight, your compassion, and the way you found, I don't, I don't know if I, I don't want to put words in your belt, but meaning, but, you know, purpose out of your pain, however you want to say that. Um, we're just in awe of that fact. So thank you. Is, is there anything else you want to tell us about 
uh, your experience with Gabriel and what led to this TED Talk before we start talking. Any other comments there? Oh, gosh. Well, he died. It's coming up on 17 years ago. And you know, so he was very quickly gone for longer than he was here. Uh, but his death really impacted every part, I, absolutely every part of my life. It changed, it clearly changed my family, it changed my relationships, it changed my career, it changed, it changed what I value, it changed the way I see the world, it changed uh, how I think about pain, um, how I think about making things better and, and seeing things in a big picture. You know, you, you just mentioned a moment ago that in your career, you've turned off the alarms thousands of times. Um, I, I, I'm sure most nurses have, and uh, I very distinctly thanked, remember thanking the nurse when she did that for me. Um, so it's it's not it's not that turning off the alarms is going to solve the problem. It's the fact that the alarms are not created to function with human beings, and that's you know looking at looking at that looking at it in that way. Um, I think is the only way we're really going to make headway. I, I mean, I never knew about alarm fatigue before then, and now, now I know too much about it. Um, so, I, I mean, I could talk about him and how he changed my life for days, but I don't, I don't think that that's why you wanted me here today. So, Thank you for sharing what you did, and I, I um, can only imagine that it changed every single facet of your life. I would appreciate hearing, though, if there's one lasting legacy of change for you, um, and, and it could be for better or worse, because I'm not even going to pretend that this, that, you know, nothing but greatness comes out of pain, because we all know, you know, I happen to think struggle is just struggle, and it can make you ugly, and it's hard, and it's, that's all there is to it, but um, how, is there something that affected your life through Gabriel's death that you would say has been important and life lasting and, and perhaps bettering? Well, I'm, um, my art came out of my grief. Um, I, I'm working on a project now where I'm writing a book and I'm interviewing parents who have lost children and asking them all a series of the same questions uh, to really understand what helped them, what did not help them. And one of the, the questions is how, how has your life been transformed by your child's death? And those are questions I never would have thought about. And that, and it brings me people I never would have had the great honor to know. And I, it is not hard for me to look at really significant relationships and people in my life that I would not have if it were not for him. And I, that is no consolation prize. And that's not saying that I wouldn't also have relationships like that if I didn't also have him. But I do feel that he is pulling a lot of strings and looking out for me. And that is... Um, I find a lot of comfort in that. Not every day, but much of the time I feel like that is that is true and um it gives me a lot of faith. It gives me a lot of faith in the future. Hmm. That's good. <clears throat> and amazing that you can say that that you found that. The producer and I were just noticing your art that's behind you. Um it's beautiful and very striking. Um, what other types of things are you doing besides the backdrop that you've got there? So um, I've done large pieces for um, a couple hospitals in the U.S. Um, I'm working, there's two other projects that are just in the very tiny beginning stages right now. So that's that's always exciting to to kind of daydream about that and look forward to doing doing bigger projects. Sure. Well, good for you. Good for you. 
a new career, <laughs> a new part of your career. So um, again, thank you for sharing the story and for what you've just told us in the last couple of minutes. Um, the audience for this podcast is called Inside Medical Malpractice, and we're not going to talk specifically about malpractice today, but we'll hit a couple of points of it. But we have a lot of doctors and nurses listening in, and many of them will be thinking, you know, please, please, please don't let me be the one who does the thing that causes death, and certainly not death to a, a child, which is, you know, a whole different level of pain, and wondering how how do I, how can I face my patients and the family afterwards? What are the valuable things that you recall that the healthcare staff said to you that were helpful versus hurtful? Because your experience seems to have been very different at the two hospitals where uh, Gabriel was, was kept. But, you know, teach us a little bit about what can a nurse or a doctor say when a medical error does happen um, that can maybe in those early minutes ease the pain a little bit or open the understanding? So a lot of that for me is a blur, those those first minutes and hours. But that Maya Angelou quote of people won't remember what you said, but they will remember how you made them feel is is very true in moments like this. Uh, I remember... I remember tears running down the neurosurgeon's cheeks um, as he talked to me. Um, he said, I remember him saying, the first 12 hours are really important. And then 12 hours passed and nothing happened. And then the first 24 hours are really important and nothing got better in that amount of time. And I realize now that he was, he knew, he knew what was happening with my son, but he was trying to take care of me and probably trying to take care of himself a bit as well. Um, I, I feel, you know, I have conversations with people who are involved in situations like this. And one of the things that they'll say to me, and this is more, I work more typically with the attorneys who are involved. That's who I'm most connected to that we'll go into meetings where we're going to have a discussion with the family and um, they'll say, Oh, I'm really afraid that I might cry during this meeting. And I, I feel like showing our humanity and our compassion and how these events have impacted us is never a bad thing. I, I really believe that it matters. It matters to know that our experience has a ripple effect and has impacted other people. It's, you know, it's important to be witnessed um, in what has happened to us and and recognizing that that those impacts go beyond ourselves is, I find it's healing. I've never had, I've, I mean, of course, it's uncomfortable. It's hard to feel that kind of sadness and that heaviness and that weight, but I, I think that it creates connection and that's what really, that's what we need in, in moments like that. Hmm. I so appreciate that you've said that because I've been present at the death of many babies you know, that were born stillborn or born, you know, born shortly, died shortly after birth. <clears throat> and I've always cried, not by choice, you know, but because this whole situation was so sad and the physicians involved would often, you know, they'd do the work they had to do and then they would leave the room because they were so uncomfortable with the emotions that were going on and the thought that they would cry, um, but never had any feedback from a patient to say that that was helpful, but just to sometimes sit there and feel it and look at the you know, the little dead baby and talk about how the hair is and how many fingers there are and that kind of thing. So I, I never, but I never knew that that was valuable. So thank you for sharing that. And the, the reason I ask about if there were words that were said, um, I had a sister who lost a baby a few years ago in labor and I was with her, the baby was born, stillborn. And what was what was amazing to me is the comments that were made and the people who came in. And there was everything from, you know, this is God's will, you're going to be strong at the end of this. There was a thousand comments, which didn't feel really good. But there was one that made us laugh so hard. This one person came in, she wasn't sober, 
And because it was probably a very difficult visit for her to make. And she just simply said, you're going to feel really, really bad for a really, really, really long time. (laughs) And like, at the time, I was like, what is that girl thinking? But at the end of the day, that's the truest thing that was spoken on that particular day. <laughs> they were, they were, she didn't have any platitudes for us. It wasn't a hug. She was drunk and she spit that out and she left. And I thought, well, at least there's some truth. There's some truth sometimes in those kind of comments. I would say there, that I would say there's a lot of truth, but not uh, a lot of elegance. Yeah. She, no compassion. Zero. <laughs> No, if we're talking about truth, compassion, and transparency, she only hit one thing. Yeah, I know. Um, Also for the doctors and nurses, risk management, hospital defense lawyers listening in, um, and with a full understanding, and I think we'll just touch just one question on malpractice here, because in this particular case, you didn't sue for malpractice, even though, you know, when you look at just the facts of the case, and I don't know them all, you know, there was potentially a viable lawsuit here, but she chose not to. And um, with full understanding that the main goal of discussion after medical error is not to avoid lawsuit, right? It's to heal. It's to do a lot of other things. It's to right a wrong. Um, We're And you talk a lot in your TED video about how the staff at Stanford managed this so well. What was Talk a little bit more about teach us, healthcare providers, teach us how to approach with the attitude, the tone of voice, the language, the words um, that you found helpful in that moment. And how can we handle these? Help us do better. Well, as I think back at it at that time, I mean, a lawsuit was not never on my mind. Um, that is not what I thought about quickly or after amount of time, much time passed. That just was not where my thought went. And I think for most people, they don't. Uh, most people want to understand what happened to them. And it's when they don't get those answers or they get jerked around, that's when they will seek those answers in a different way. So I had I had no frame of reference of what to expect after my child died. I feel like Stanford took appropriate and good care of me and I had no con- no context or understanding at all to realize and recognize that that was exceptional. 16 years ago, it was exceptional, and now it still continues to be exceptional, which is very disappointing to me. So, you know, I never went, I never thought, oh, I'm going to sue them. I mean, I I could hardly get out of bed, let alone think about calling an attorney, diving into that. So I, I think it's a myth to think that that is the default, Um. A lot of us just need to want to survive and get through that. And I i mean, maybe if I hadn't gotten answers, if I had been jerked around the way that I essentially was by the hospital in Reno, um, if Stanford had done that as well, it could have been different for me. But the statute of limitations is a year. And when you are in that kind of place to make thoughtful, rational decisions, is very it's very difficult um but i do i do very firmly believe that the reason i am moving through the world and doing really quite well and most days feel a lot of joy is because i don't have lingering questions about what happened to my son and i've i have met many many people who do not know what happened even to themselves or to loved ones, um, and that, it's like an infection. It's like a low-grade fever that people carry around, and they can they can function, they can go through their life, but they are never going to thrive because they've never had the dignity of an explanation to understand what happened to them. And I know, I know what happened. I know most of what happened. There's still a couple li- lingering questions in there for me, but I was, I was always treated, um, 
I wouldn't say carefully. I was treated kindly and compassionately and the people who were involved really cared. There, there was no pretense about whether they cared or not. I knew that they did. They told me what was gonna happen next. They stuck to what they said they were gonna do. You know, no one said, oh, we'll call you next week and then didn't call. They, they gave me the opportunity to answer, to ask all of the questions that I had. Um, I remember after the review had been done and they wanted to meet with us to explain what had happened, I had, I had a lot of questions and I wrote them all down and I had handouts for everybody. And I said, well, once you're done talking, I have some things that I want to say. And they said, no, why don't you go first? And they gave me the opportunity to ask what I wanted to say. And so now when, when I'm involved as a liaison in those meetings, um, that's what we do first. We ask what the patient and the family want to know before we dive into what we feel is important for them to understand. And of course it is important, but it is often not what is most on the patient and family's mind and what they most need to understand. And so um, that's the approach that, that I advocate for and that has worked pretty well for us. Mm. We're going to talk more about that in a sec, about your day-to-day -day job and the work you do, because I'm quite fascinated by it. But I just want to emphasize that you're absolutely right. Um, you know, your comment about leaves a low-grade infection and just leaves so many questions and worrying. Because my involvement in these errors is when there's been significant injury and they have sought legal advice. <clears throat> and I rarely meet with a patient, um, but I get to know them very, very well by reading every word of their medical record and their deposition and talking to them to the lawyers. And they're, um, you know, one experienced lawyer that I've worked with a lot said, there's never, ever a patient that comes into my office that doesn't start the conversation with, I am as mad as hell, and I don't know what went on. I need some answers. So your assessment of um, what happens when truth and, truth, and, or truth and compassion transparency isn't applied to an error situation is absolutely bang on. Because by the time they get to a lawyer, you're right, it's it's because, it's, or sometimes in spite of, but sometimes because they don't feel they've had any answers and they want to know. And sometimes it goes on for years. You know, when it involves a child, the statute of limitations is 18 years and sometimes longer for mentally ill patients. And so um, you're bang on on that is what I wanted to say. Your assessment is correct. So tell us, so you've made this amazing transition from mother in the hospital with your sick baby and now you work for Stanford in their risk management department and, you know, mentioned patient liaison. Can you talk to us about your day-to-day -day work? Like, what does a typical day look like for you? And um, discuss how it's evolved or evolving over time. So my day-to-day, -day, it, it, it depends. Um, each case that I find out about and participate in is, is going to be different, which is one of the things that I really love about it. Um, I love that there's new medicine that I get to learn about, um, and there's new patients and families for me to work with. So even though we may, we as the hospital system may have really gotten this, this system of review and checking the boxes and going through our process and we're really solid on it and we're on the same page, um, the patient and the family, it's brand new to them every single time. And so it's important that I bring like a beginner's mind each time to those conversations. So I, I work with, I mean, there could be days where I talk to seven or eight patients and families in a day, or there could be days where I don't speak to any. Um, it just depends on where we are in our review, what kind of um, connection or involvement patients and families want. Some want to talk to me every day and others are very reluctant to talk to me at all. Um, and that is, I respect that. And we move at the pace that is going to work best for them. 
So um, it just it just kind of depends, but I really try to meet the patients and families where they are and not expect them to come and move along at a pace that we move at. Um, something that's really important and challenging to me is setting expectations for patients and families. Um, again, for most of them, this is an entirely new situation. Often they are struggling, maybe they themselves are struggling to recover, maybe they're grieving, maybe they are um, needing to take care of a patient or a family member in a way that they were not anticipating. Um, it, it turns people's lives upside down completely. And, you know, we don't often when we do these reviews, when we find out about things, we don't know exactly what happened. And oftentimes we find out that the outcome was, was not preventable. Um, and those are, those are conversations that have to be had and explanations that we, that we believe patients and families have the right to understand and to, for them to have the opportunity to ask their questions. Um, that doesn't mean it's easy, <laughs> far from it. You know, there are, there are days where I, I wake up and I think, huh, how many people am I going to disappoint today? Um, you know, it is being, being honest and truthful is not about being a hero. It's about being honest and truthful. And, um, a lot of times we tell people things that they don't really want to hear. Um, nonetheless, that is what has to be said. And so um, that it's, it's endlessly interesting because people are so fascinating. Um, but it's, it's, it's not all rainbows and unicorns and everyone's going to be friends and come together. Um, it's, it's, it's far more complex than that. Of course, the whole aspect of it can be very adversarial and very full of difficult, difficult conversations. Is there a, um, <clears throat> you know, in nursing research has showed that so many errors happen around communication, assessment, med errors, equipment errors, <clears throat> excuse me, is there a kind of a typical case or can you give us a synopsis of the, like a typical error that you might see that would end up in your office when you're talking to the family? Oh, I don't think there's anything typical about any of them, but I would say the vast majority communication is part of it. A communication, a miscommunication, a dropped communication, a good intention that didn't connect with where it needed to connect. Um, the cases that I get are ones that the outcome is significant um, and where it can be leaked back to an event. So I'm not talking to people who have had things not go well in the expected course of their care, typically. I mean, sometimes our reviews will determine that and then those are the conversations. But I'm not talking to people, I am not doing service recovery work at all. I'm doing things where there was a medical outcome um, as a result of, of an incident that we can go back and see and connect it to. Understood. You also mentioned that you do some liaison work with the hospital law team, legal team. Um, what does that part of your job look like? So every case that we have that we review as a PEARL, that's kind of our acronym for, for our um, communication and resolution program. I work with um, a claims manager, one of the hospital's attorneys. So that person and I will get very, very familiar with the case. Um, I'm the one who I'm more outwardly focused. So I'm speaking with the patient and the family understanding their point of view, um, trying to answer their questions. Um, there's often a fair amount of paperwork that we need to understand from them, um, depending on, you know, depending on what happened. There's all kinds of, there's liens that need to be reviewed. Maybe there's going to be compensation for lost income, all of those components. So I am the one who connects with the patient and the family over that. And then the attorneys will work um, more closely with the physicians, um, doing the ex expert reviews, 
that kind of thing. And then we, we collaborate. I mean, there's a lot of collaboration. Um, I don't ever have any conversation with, with the patient and the family that the attorneys aren't aware of. I mean, I guess I shouldn't say never. Some of times there's nothing relevant for them, but, um, there, we collaborate really, really closely. Um, it's important to me that there's never any expectations set for the patient and family that we are not going to be able to meet. So I, I am, I don't talk about compensation until we know quite a bit about that case when we can look ahead and be seeing what's coming. Um, I don't do that. Um, it's, it's a lot, a lot of what I'm doing is attempting to rebuild some trust um, while also advocating for the patient and the family as, as best as I can. So um, it's the attorneys that I get to work with. It's, it's very collaborative. There's a lot of teamwork and um, I'm fortunate that I, I learn, I'm able to learn a lot from them and it's, it's a good, it it's, works for us quite well. Did this role exist before you filled it or have you stepped into it and created it? It didn't exist at Stanford, no. So it was it was created. I I was given the opportunity to come in and work on a really um, quite finite project, and then um, kind of made my way through there. and And they were very open and accepting and encouraging of that, which is that is remarkable. It's really quite remarkable to to think about that happening. Um, and I, I, I appreciate it very, very much. It is remarkable. And what a great role. And I think not, I mean, I don't know what percentage of hospitals have it, but I've never worked in a hospital that had it. You know, I've sent so many patients home after a catastrophic event and just watched them walk out the door and just blessed them on their way and hoped, hoped that they did okay. But there isn't always any follow-up to you know, to the outfall of the errors, the injuries, anything that's happened. So thank you. Thank you so much for that good work that you're doing. I'm really proud of you for doing it. What did you do before this? Like, did you come into this with a medical background or did you have a completely different? Oh, completely not. No, I studied art and architecture in college. I was working as a graphic designer when my kids were little. Um, so I, I think about back now of when I started this work and was just plumped down in, into this world of this legal and medical world. And I, I really had no idea, like stranger in a strange land for sure. And I look back now and I, and I remember some of the questions that I would ask and what about this and what about that? And now I recognize that those were so, so naive. And yet it really was, they were important questions to ask. And I just brought a really different way of looking at things. And one of the things that I really pushed for was that we would reach out to patients and families when we thought something had not gone well and not wait for them to come to us. Um, you know, oh, well, let's not bother them. Let's not do anything. Well, doing nothing is impossible and it actually does a lot. And so that's why when we know, or we, maybe we don't know, we're, we have good reason to be concerned about something. That is when I initially reach out to patients and families and start connecting with them. Um, and that's, that has served, that has served us well. I've never had anybody say, oh, we never want to speak to you again. I, that has never happened. Um, I'm not saying that every person I've dealt with has been lovely and thrilled to talk to me. That is not true either. But um, most people are are appreciative. They want to be listened to. They're vulnerable. Very rarely are they angry. I think that's a myth that we think that patients and families um, are angry. They... I think in a lot of times they don't have the energy to be angry, um, but they're always vulnerable and they're almost always sad. So um, I think that's that's an important thing to be to be aware of. I don't I 
not even sure what your question was, Chris. I think I talked all the way around it. I think <clears throat> I think it was a really good answer. But I want to ask a question within that. How do you become aware that there's been an accident or an injury that you need to step in and explain? <clears throat> So the hospital has um, various systems for alerting risk management about um, incidents that happen. And then those may go through a preliminary review, just depending on what they are. We work really closely with patient safety so that not only can we learn what happened in these incidents, in the the ones where that we specifically know about, but also work to keep them from happening again, uh, which is as I'm sure you're aware, is also another really big priority of patients and families that their suffering is not in vain and that there is some real and significant change that happens because of what happened to them. Absolutely. Absolutely. Pardon me. And it sometimes seems that that takes forever. You know, I was reading the other day that by the time an error or an accident happens and perhaps a case goes through the courts and, um, the powers that be review and change the medical policies and procedure and nursing policies and procedures. It can sometimes be a time frame of seven years from the accident until the nursing staff, for instance, is alerted that there's a new way to do something. I mean, sometimes it happens quicker than that because we just change it because we were there and we saw the injury happen. But um, it's a slow, kind of slow, painful process sometimes. But maybe it's quicker where you are. Do you think it is? Like that the feedback and the change the feedback effects change sooner? I think so, yes. I mean, that opportunity is there, right, is to learn and and move forward with making people safer. Um, not just, you know, our motivation is not just to avoid litigation. It's it's to continue to care for, for people who we consider to be our patients. And we want to care for, for those, the ones we have now and the ones who we'll have in the future. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, seven years is a long time, right? There's a lot of other people who could be injured in that time. Exactly. It's too long. So you've mentioned a couple of times about the hard conversations and the difficulties of your job, and I have no doubt that you're speaking the truth to us. How do you keep yourself physically and emotionally above water when this is your day-to-day job? Uh, I used to have a harder time with it than I do now. Um, one of the things that I've learned from this work is to recognize my limited sphere of influence. So, um, and what I mean to kind of metaphor for that is, you know, I can set the table, I can make you dinner, I can invite you over, but I cannot make you eat. And so, um, I, I cannot take complete care of the patients and families who I work with. Um, a lot of, a lot of what they are going to go through is, is going to be things that they have to deal with on their own. Um, particularly around grief. Um, you know, we, we can give people answers hopefully is, or maybe eliminate questions. I don't know that we always can complete, we, I can't say that we always answer every question. We don't, but hopefully we can eliminate some of the questions. But um, that idea of, oh, we'll get these answers and then we'll feel so much better and we'll have closure. I don't think it works that way. Um, I think each, each patient and family has a lot of work that they are going to have to do themselves. And so um that has helped me. I think when I first started, a lot of what I thought was, oh, that these were going to fix all of these problems. And now, now I know the machine is really big and very complicated. And I, I've learned to find joy in small victories um, because they, they really matter. Um, you know, I, I do my art. I have a lot of creative outlets. Um, I, try to be in nature every day if I possibly can. I have close connections with family and friends that I really rely on. Um, so all, all of those things matter. I also have really fantastic colleagues who we can talk through these things together, um, which is really helpful because we, you know, particularly the attorneys who are on these cases with me, we 
we feel we feel a lot of things about these things and need to talk it through and that's that's really helpful for me and I think probably for them. I'm sure it is. <clears throat> Pardon me, I'm sure it is. Because I think it can be, you know, for the attorneys, I think it can be a lonely job and they aren't necessarily by nature emotionally sharing. So I've always appreciated a chance to sit down and talk. And and doctors as well. aren't. It's not always easy for them to open up. Always appreciated the chance to sit down and say, you know, let's, t- let's talk about this. How are you feeling? This is how I'm feeling. So that's good. I'm glad um, that you've got those outlets, those social, those artistic outlets, um, some support from family and friends and colleagues, because that's what gets you through. I certainly know as a nurse on some of the worst days of my nursing life when terrible things happened, um, just to go to the staff room at the end of the day and cry and laugh and eat something. I'll tell you, you would never set a table for me, Lelani, and I wouldn't sit down and eat it because I, <laughs> I would eat everything you put on the table. <clears throat> Excuse me. But um, it's... Um, it's those kind of things that get you through. So I appreciate that you found that network because in my mind, the work you're doing is very difficult. It's very, very difficult. And, but I'm so grateful that you're doing it and finding a way to care for yourself. How, how do you hope your work um, either has am- impacted or will impact in the future uh, reduction in errors in medicine? Well, um, studies will tell you that it's not getting better. Um, there was a paper out um, recently about, I think the title is something like Who Killed Patient Safety? Um, and it really talks about um, COVID, COVID's impact on patient safety in hospitals. Um, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know. Um, I know that I... The work that I do with my colleagues that we impact people one by one. Um, I think we take pretty good care of patients and families um, within the constraints that we have to work within. Um, I think that we do learn from mistakes and do make people safer, but medicine is so profoundly complex. And it's hard to it's hard to move that needle. I mean, there are people who spend their entire careers trying to do this work, and it is it is relentless. Like it is relentless. You might think you've solved one problem here, and then a new one comes along, and you you have to just stay so tenacious. And I profoundly admire the people who can do that. Um, but it it's it's hard to know. It's hard to know. And that kind of goes back to that idea of, of finding joy in really small victories is that I can't, you know, I can't solve all these problems, but if I can make work with the patient and the family and bring them some answers and let them ask some questions and put away some money to help their kid go to college or whatever they choose to do with it. Um, that's good. Recognizing that money is not the fix um, for anybody in those things, I, I don't. Th- I don't think it necessarily makes things worse. But um, money does not heal. I, I know that for sh- sure. Um, but compassion and answers and connections can help. So that's 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 the the scope that I have some influence on, and so that's where I I try to focus. I really appreciate that you said that because if you are a compassionate person, you see all the problems in many things, you know, everything from climate change to the current war to the pandemic to drug addiction and overdoses. I mean, you could just see everything. And um, I feel a lot like you in the regard that you have to choose what's yours to do and do it well. <clears throat> and trust that someone else will do all the other stuff around that. Even in the part of this medical era that I work in, you know, the litigation part, I fully understand I have a role to play, but it's a small role, and I do the best I can, and I hope. It's kind of interesting. I just cleaned out a closet. I've been doing this for 20 years, and I just cleaned out a closet that probably had 56 boxes of medical records and fetal monitor tracings in them. And they're being picked up by a shredder 
as we speak at, at the front door. And just looking back on that and saying goodbye to it. And also, I do mostly obstetrical, poor obstetrical outcomes. So like literally standing in front of all that paperwork and just blessing every one of those babies and their families well, wishing them the best I could, and then saying goodbye to it, um, hoping that you've done something to make them better, but knowing that they're not fixed, that they maybe got money, but they're still living with a a neurologically damaged child. So it's interesting. I'm really connecting with you on that point finding where you do help and finding joy in how you help and let the rest of it be done by someone else, you know? Um, And I often call it, that's not mine to do. If there's a job that's too big or I just can't, I just literally say those words, that's not mine to do, but this is mine to do and I'll do it. I'll do it really well. Um, So my next question is what roles have you made things better? But I think you answered that question really nicely as part of your last question is you really help people at that time in that moment and meet them where they are. Uh, In what ways is there still work to be done? I guess the way that I was treated at Stanford and the way that we try to treat people now is still regarded as exceptional and a revolution like that. That should not be. Um, I've I've had I've been fortunate to be able to speak to media several times and be in you know big newspapers and all of that, which you know I thought would my daughter would be impressed with, and she really never is impressed with any of that. <laughs> um, but what what is sad about when those things happen and could happen from this podcast as well is people will contact me and ask me to help them. So people from around the country will contact me and say, hey, can you call my doctor and tell him that I still don't understand? What can you, how can you help? I need help. Will you help me? And that should not be happening. Like telling the truth and explaining what happened to patients should not be seen as something that you want to talk to me about on a podcast. That should not be special or exceptional or new insight. It just shouldn't be. It should be the way that we treat each other. Um, So that is not getting better. It has not gotten better. Um, Maybe some places, there are are hospital systems that are doing great. Um, Ascension Health is doing a fantastic job. There's other hospitals around the country that are doing a really great job, but it is still the exception and not the rule. And that keeps all of us from being safer. And And we all are eventually going to need to be cared for in some way. And I don't think that we're really doing what we can to make, make each other safer. And that's too bad. I love in your, um, in your TED Talk how you talked about how all of us are going to have that little plastic band put on our wrist one day and be a patient or a loved one will be a patient. And, um, you know, we can all think and pretend that that nothing bad will ever happen to us in our life, but the odds are it's going to, and that could certainly be uh, put a sense of urgency behind it. I love the point you just made up because, um, or that you just brought up, because I listened to your second TED Talk, which we'll talk a little bit about, and for everybody listening, it's called Compelling Perspectives and Standards of Care. Um, and it was, it's another great talk. I really enjoyed it. But she really brought up that particular point there of when did disclosure and transparency become cutting edge medicine? You know, why? Why? Why isn't that the standard of care? But I, I know from working for 35 years in a hospital setting and always labor and delivery, almost always labor and delivery, um, it isn't the standard of care. It, it just isn't. And there is a lot of hiding and, you know, sometimes a terrible thing will happen and staff changes and the doctor's off for the weekend and the patient is discharged by Monday morning. And there isn't even a single person who was there that knows anything about the event other than what's written in the medical record and the follow-up never takes place. So, And there's sometimes a lot of blame about who's at fault and infighting and problems. So there's still so much work to be done. Um, you know, and you and I aren't going to fix this ourselves anyway, but 
um, maybe someone listening in is going to have some kind of an urgent event to get out there and, you know, to work or has great ideas about way to improve healthcare. But I also appreciated both of your talks, how you talked about, you know, the fallibility of humans, like we're going to make mistakes. There is no way that we're going to ever get rid completely of medical errors. So um, the work is eternal. You know, it's not, there's not going to be a fix or a checklist. I think your point about how um, maybe there's blaming or the patient goes home and there's been no answer. I think that that is something that we really need to understand. So I think if you're, if you get really cynical about this work, we can say, well, the doctor just has to explain it. Why don't they explain it? There's something wrong with them because they're not coming forward and they're not explaining what happened. And I, I don't think that that is an effective way to make change. I think if we, we, it's important that we understand why that physician is not coming forward. Do they feel unsupported? Do they not understand what to say? Do they feel like they're going to be making promises that they aren't going to keep? Are they going to need to speak on behalf of others. I mean, that they're put in a, in a very difficult situation if they are not supported and advocated for. And so when things go south, if there is no structure to support them and to help them with that, I, I, I think it's an unreasonable expectation to think that they are going to stand up and, and give a full accounting of what, of what happened. Um, because you and I both know that's at great personal risk to them. And so there's really a lot of work to be done with leadership. I mean, if leadership is not involved with these programs and monitoring them and paying attention and the board isn't asking questions and wants to know what's going on, it is very difficult to make these changes from the bottom up. It's really difficult. And, and you know, there are, there are groups that are working on this and that offer a lot of resources. I'm on, I'm on the board for the Collaborative for Accountability and Improvement. That website has a wealth of information on it. Um, Massachusetts has done really, really impressive, jo an impressive job. Um, their website is, what is it? Macrame, I believe, where they've, they've done a very impressive work around these kind of efforts. Um, and so there's a lot of resources there. So there is, there are best practices. This does not need to be, you know, we don't need to recreate the wheel. We can learn from each other. There's a lot of ways to do that. But um, it's important not to, I feel, not to blame. It's really important to understand. Um, and I think that, that that will help us move things more quickly is if we try to understand what motivates people rather than deciding they're doing things poorly. I agree. And again, that's a, another very compassionate and um, experienced and intelligent look at the issue because it's never simple. And I, I'll tell you, I have never met a doctor or a nurse and certainly not in any of my training was I prepared for that conversation. You know, I, and there's been a lot of work done about the no-fault apology and how it doesn't increase litigation. And again, I'm with you on the page that the goal of this is never to stop litigation. The goal of it's to, you know, affect patient safety and smooth the process, the path for people who have been injured. But um, when it does happen, and thank God it doesn't happen often. I mean, I happen to know that lots of what go goes on in a hospital is miraculous every single day. But um, when it does go wrong, none of us have been really well trained, you know, the emotional intelligence, the calmness, just the words even, to go in and have that conversation with the patient. So the blame doesn't happen sometimes on who did, who said, or who didn't say what, but it's often you did that, you didn't do that, you didn't tell me that, you know, it's kind of within the team. There's some infighting about why the error happened. And that's not all that helpful either. I mean... You really have to like de-escalate the situation before you can get anybody to talk to anybody sometimes because it's high, it's high, high, high emotion, you know, when serious errors happen. It's high emotion, but it also uh, doesn't move towards recognizing the, the complexity of the system and 
it doesn't move towards solving system errors. And that puts all of us in jeopardy. I mean, I, I would never want to work in a clinical hospital setting. No way. No way. Um, and I, I will endlessly admire the people who are brave enough to do that, but I, I would not do that. Um, it's, it's far too, not easy, but there, it, it is, it is complex. And then when you, you take human beings who are also fortunately quite complex and put them, layer them on top of it, it's a big problem to solve. It's a huge problem to solve. And I think we're all watching this um, complicated systems <clears throat> errors go down in the recent case of Radon Devad, the Nashville, Tennessee nurse. Um, you know, when you look at all the issues in that case, it wasn't just a nurse who gave a wrong drug. There are lots, lots of things going on there that need to be examined. And so we won't get into that because that's a big subject that I could talk about for hours. But let's um, let's move on a little bit. I'd like to ask you, um, I, I told you I listened to your second TED Talk, and I loved your, uh, in particular, a couple of comments about, uh, you know, in Gabriel's case, it was a monitor that was turned off, and it got turned off everywhere, and so failed to alert anybody when his his heart and or respiration stopped, which I'm so sorry to hear that, but I really loved your um your description about how technology fails to consider the human element of compassion and, you know, the, just the human caring, the human caring. And it's funny. I, I told you, my husband has watched this video with me a few times and he's, he's happens to be an IT guy. And he says to me like, Chris, like you gotta understand those guys, in, those machines are just sitting in a room coding. And they're just like, if this happens, do that. And if that happens, do that. And if this happens, turn off. And you know, he said, that's how it is, which to me, um, there's the reality of what happened to you. And there's the reality of the guy in the room building the code for the machine and a huge lack of cooperation and understanding between the industries that ha that really need to work so closely together. I, w I one time started in a brand new hospital. Um, you know, we just opened up the first ward. It was a labor and delivery ward. And the day we moved in, we found out that none of the beds would fit through the doors, you know, and that's something simple and it's not life threatening, <laughs> but it's just like, <laughs> wait a sec. Why? This is a basic, you know, labor and delivery. You're transferring patients to the OR, to the delivery room, to diagnostic imaging, a thousand ultrasound all the time. Like, how how exactly did this happen that they failed to consider the actual day to day reality of what goes on in a hospital? So I so appreciated you highlighting that between because technology is just coming at full speed to us. You can barely keep up with some of the machines and the stuff in the hospital. But we're all still going to remain to be human, and we all try to be caring, and we try to be loving, and we try to give a tired mama time to sleep and a baby an opportunity to rest. How how do you what do you see as a fix for that problem? Well, you know, you talk about, or your husband talked about, you know, it's coders working in a room somewhere, working on their concise, sheltered, isolated piece of equipment, right? they're not seeing how it functions in the setting that it's going to be in. And, you know, I think about, you know, our iPhones. How many times has, how many human beings touch those so that they knew they made the right decision? How they, they learned that. I mean, how many focus groups were, were in existence to work on those, those phones? You know, BMW does not, create a car and expect to sell it without knowing how the people who use it are going to want it to be. And so, uh, I mean, I, I have heard so many just outrageous horror stories about monitors and I, I don't know how many of them are true, but one of the things I remember hearing is, oh, well, when monitors are sent to the hospitals, there's very little documentation about how they work. Very little. And that's because, as I was told, maybe true, maybe not, that the more that is printed and documented about how to use that equipment, the more liability there is for the manufacturer. And that's really pretty sick and twisted. 
if that's what's going on. And so it seems like there's, there is this built in antagonism between the, these, these groups when we're all on the using end of it. So, I, I mean, I don't know, I don't understand industrial design. I don't particularly want to, but I do feel like there's opportunities to put these machines in the environments where they're going to be used and to figure them out. Um, and I, I mean, I'm not the smartest bulb on the tree by anything, by any means, but it, it just seems like there's, there's a lot of opportunities there to do that. Yeah, I think the really smart thing you did here is just to highlight that gap in communication. You know, the failure, and I'm not saying every piece of equipment, but in many pieces of equipment, to um, understand really all the ways in which that equipment might be used and the normal behaviors of not only the people using it, but the patients who will be monitored. <laughs> and, you know, I talked about all the alarms I've shot off in my life. I happen to be in a busy ER just by, you know, unfortunate happenstance with someone a couple of weeks ago and um, the alarms going off all day that were ignored all day were just like drove me crazy for the first 45 minutes. But after I was there eight hours, they also became background noise to me. But there was just alarming all day long that was ignored, basically. So that was another really perfect example of a machine, you know, technically alarming when it was supposed to. But in reality, it either wasn't a relevant alarm or um, there was a level of alarm fatigue in that ER that nurses are like, oh, you know, just stop, just shut it off. So that's kind of interesting. So that's a big fix. So I guess that's too much to ask you how to fix that problem. But I do want to say I so appreciate that you've highlighted that issue because it's real. And working in the hospital, you know how you're talking about the information that you get with the machine. That's very true. We would often get like a new IV pump or an epidural pump. There'd be a little five by seven you know, laminated instruction sheet attached to the pole that it was on, we get a 10 minute seminar on it. And, um, you know, because there's tons of nurses, it takes six weeks to get everybody through that 10 minute seminar. And then one day, six weeks after you've taken a 10 minute course on it, you show up and that's your new pump for that forever. You now the old pump's gone and that's your new pump. And you really don't have a good handle on how to use it, the capacity, the potential to do harm, you don't, you don't know. So I really so appreciate that you've highlighted that problem. And, you know, we need to get tech and healthcare talking maybe a little bit more on some of these issues. I also um, loved your comment that because we're human, we all will make mistakes. And it gives us, and this is a quote from what you said, a mandatory obligation to be ready when things go wrong. I really appreciated that as well. And you also made a comment that all the work to prevent medical errors will be erased if healthcare doesn't do a good job of handling the fallout. Can you expand a little bit on your thoughts there? Well, that that is a quote from kind of a long time ago, so I'm not exactly sure what I was thinking about it. But something uh, that I think about with it now is... You know, nobody wants bad things to happen in a hospital. Like, there, there's no intention. I know that no one made a decision wanting Gabriel to die. And if anybody could have undone it, they would they would do it. They would go back and make make a different decision or handle the situation differently. I have, I have no doubt about that. But we can't do that. But what where we do have the opportunity to make decisions and take actions is where we respond and how we respond. That is a deliberate decision. So the hospital in Reno where I lived, well, I still live, and where Gabriel was treated, it was a very deliberate decision on their part not to respond to me, not to return my calls, not to answer my letters, not to answer my questions. That was a deliberate choice. Just like Stanford's decision to talk to me, to explain, to apologize and learn, those two were deliberate decisions that they made. And I really feel that when these bad things happen, 
there is a lot of opportunity. There's a lot of opportunity to keep a bad thing from getting worse. And we should do that. We should do that just as a function of the standard of care. And I am not saying that it's easy. It's not. And I am not saying that things won't go wrong. Sometimes they will, but it is still worth doing. And it's important to do um, as, as a method of taking care of each other and keeping each other safer. And, you know, sometimes I'll go, I'll talk to other hospital systems and I'll hear things like, oh yeah, we tried that once and it didn't work. And I, I, of course, then have a lot of questions about exactly what they tried. But I will say, oh, yeah, well, imagine if the first time a kidney was transplanted and it didn't work, we never tried again. We don't do that, right? We don't. It's like we expect things to go. If, if disclosure and early resolution doesn't go perfectly, then we're never going to try it again. And we, d we don't take that approach in other places in medicine, we keep trying to learn and keep trying to do a better job. And that's where there's a lot of opportunity. That's a really good point, just to keep trying at it. And, to, and I really appreciate it when you said in the beginning, too, there's no two families that are the same. There's no two conversations. There's no two situations that are the same. Um, but I know, you know, certainly within healthcare, doctors and nurses are nimble at those. You know, everything's different. But this is a conversation we've never, we've never learned. So I'm so grateful to be talking to you and so grateful that you've taken on that job of having that conversation. Because I know without a doubt that it means a lot to the people that you work with. And um, it will make things better for them. So listen, we've been talking for more than an hour. I could talk to you for a uh, a hundred years, I feel like, but <clears throat> I ask everybody this one particular question at the end of every podcast, and I'd like to ask it of you today, be the last question that we have. And it's because podcast listeners, lawyers, doctors, nurses, and the public are part of our audience. Please answer this question for each one. And let's start with um, doctors. <laughs> In your view, what is the most important thing healthcare providers need to know about medical errors and dealing with their fallout? And you can lump nurses in that group if you want to. If it's all healthcare providers and you've got the same thing to say, feel free to do Yeah, I, I think I would say the same thing. Um, doing nothing, saying nothing does nothing good. Um, pretending a bad thing didn't happen does not make it go away. It likely is going to make it worse. Um, I think if there's not a policy or an infrastructure to help you at your hospital, I think it would be good to try to get one because, I mean, the, the statistics about errors happening, it it's just staggering. It's absolutely staggering. And Hopefully the, the things that most people experience are really quite minor, but um, there's always a chance that it won't be. So I think not coming forward and talking about what happened is it's, it's not a good thing. It doesn't, you know, how would you want to be treated? How would you want your family member to be treated if, if they were on the receiving end of that or yourself? I think most of us would want to understand what happened to us. Yeah, I agree. Good point. Answer that question for the public. What do you think the public needs to know about medical errors and dealing with the fallout? Um, I think they. I think it would be good if they understood how frequent they are. Um, most lay people, you know, the civilians who don't work in healthcare, don't even know what the words patient safety means. It just doesn't even dawn on them that they won't be safe when they go into the hospital. Um, I think that having them understand how important that work is and how vulnerable we all are is important. Um, we all have a role to play in it. We're all responsible for each other. And I think that would be helpful. I also think it would be good if patients and families had a resource um, of where they could go after they have experienced an event like this, or they feel that they have experienced an event like this so that they could understand how 
the system works and maybe um, get some guidance on the approach to get the answers that they want. Um, I think that that would be really helpful for people. That seems to be kind of a, a kept secret, um, which which will drive patients and families to go to um, attorneys when they don't know how to get those answers. So I think if we could make it a little easier for those discussions, that would be that'd be a really good thing. Hmm. <clears throat> Excuse me, that's a good point because I will say, um, you know, just because they call an attorney doesn't mean they have a valid case or a case of any merit. And that's kind of interesting too, because attorneys will tell you they get a hundred calls a week and maybe one of them or two of them will be even remotely valid. It's mostly people who are left angry and questioning and upset and without any, and without support and without explanation. So for the lawyers listening in, there's a good, um, you know, a program like this, uh, could help you out too. You know, they spend a lot of time talking to people who don't really have a case because we all know bad things happen sometimes. It's not the fault of anyone. So answer that same question now for uh, attorneys. What would you like them to know the most important thing about medical errors and the fallout of it? I think that there's better ways to take care of patients and families after and errors happen than getting involved in litigation. Um, I think most attorneys want to help patients and families. And there's, you know, there's some cases that I've worked on where the family getting an attorney has been a, has been a good thing for everyone. Um, but malpractice litigation does not make people safer in the hospitals. And that is something that should worry all of us. And it's missed opportunities when things just go into litigation and don't and don't move towards understanding what happened more quickly. You know, to your point, Chris, you said it sometimes it can take seven years to implement some changes. Um, you know, uh, lawsuits take that long or longer, and it, who's who's benefiting from that? I'm not really sure anybody is really benefiting from that. But it, I, I just don't see, I see the really, the missing point there is that it's not making anybody safer. That's a really good point. And, you know, um, I just want to talk about when you said nobody's benefiting, nobody's learning from these accidents, a lot of, a great number of lawsuits settle out of court and they're often accompanied by a gag order or a silencing order. And the lessons from those lawsuits go nowhere. You know, no one talks about them. I think about non-disclosure issues quite a bit. Um, I didn't sign one with my son. So that gave me an opportunity to do the things that I'm doing now. Um, but we know we know that so much healing comes from being able to tell our stories. Like there's like psychological studies done of how people who go through traumas being able to tell that story over and over again. Um reduces the pain from it. And so having those NDAs attached to settlements where there is no opportunity for patients and families to move forward and make help solve a problem that they know better than anyone else often is an additional pain. Um, you know, I, I talk to a lot of people, patients who've had bad things happen to them and they, they want to work on it. They want to help, but they, they have the gag orders, and I, I think that's a big disservice, and another missed opportunity to. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah, good point. Before we sign off, is there anything else on your mind? I guess I would say that this work is complicated and challenging, but far from impossible, and really, really worth it. It's, it's really worth the difficulty of sitting with your own pain to help other people understand theirs. And, and really quite healing. Um, you know, I've had the opportunity to see forgiveness before my eyes of where patients and families have, have thanked 
physicians for their explanations and, and said things like, I don't want you to worry about this anymore. We know that you did the very best thing. And like that is, that is an amazing thing to see. I've seen a look of guilt move off of a mother's face when she has the opportunity to understand that it, what happened to her child was not her fault. Um, and that kind of connection and healing and a new perspective does not come on our own. We need each other to help help find that. And it's it's worth it and it's important. And and people who are in healthcare, they do hard things every single day. And this this might just be another one of them that needs to happen. Thank you. That was very touching and moving, what you just said. And thank you for calling nurses brave. And I just want to call you brave right back for the work that you're doing. It's great work. So thank you so much, Lailani, for this open, touching, intelligent, insightful sharing. And thank you from all of us for turning your painful experience uh, into something that can help other people through theirs. It's um, been an absolute pleasure talking to you, and I have absolutely no doubt that everyone listening or watching picked up something really valuable out of this conversation today. If you haven't heard it yet, don't miss the shorter podcast, and it's more personal about Lailani Schweitzer, where she's going to talk a little bit more about her personal life, what gets her out of bed in the morning, and tells us what she does when she's not busy working. So don't miss it. Thanks so much for listening. Goodbye and take good care.